Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Small Triumph Sports Library and Archives channel. I return today after several weeks away from video production, largely because of work obligations, but the weather is getting consistently warmer. I recently purchased a new old stock original GT6 luggage floor carpet from TD Fitchett, uh, which is laying across uh, the back of my futon behind me as I try to relax some of the creases in it from long-term storage. It's giving my office a wonderful uh, old British sports car smell, uh, which is inspiring, and it's time to get back to uh, producing a video. Today's video may very well be the nerdiest Triumph video of all time. I'm really going to indulge my English professor and professional editor side. I'll go ahead and announce that there's not going to be any tremendous payoff uh, at the end of this video. Probably not something that I should state at the outset, but I do believe in truth in advertising. What I hope to deliver is a little journey that will provide some potentially interesting observations if you stick with it. So that's my goal. Today's video revolves around the various ways different parts of the Triumph organization presented the model name GT6 over the course of its production run, with a particular focus on the 1968 to 1970 window, because I have a 1969 GT6, and a lot of my focus has been on that period, and a lot of the documents that I've collected are related to that period. I'm sure someone out there will be able to offer some corrections or additional information to what I present today, and I 100% invite that, as always. Before we get to the GT6 specifically, uh, we need to talk a little bit about the way that Triumph presented the names for its famous post-war sports car line, specifically the TR series. Now, I have not researched the TR series in anything like the depth with which I've researched the Spitfires and GT6s, so I'm a little bit out of my area here, but I'll do my best and viewers can kindly let me know where I stumble. So on to the uh, slideshow. The TR series is generally acknowledged to have started or false started around 1950 with the development of the TRX, a car that never reached production. At least one book on my shelf says that with the TRX designation, TR meant triumph and the X was short for experimental. And this makes sense in the context of standard triumph with some cars being developed as standards and others as triumphs. But this explanation for the TRX designation suggests that the TR in the TR series at least originally stood for Triumph, but as far as I can tell, the TRX car was displayed and promoted as the Triumph Roadster, not according to the TRX designation. And indeed, if one searches the internet, one will find the claim that TR stands for Triumph Roadster, T for Triumph, R for Roadster. Well, I don't see that from anything like an authoritative source. The books covering general triumph history on my shelf don't seem to address this issue, and I probably should have asked around, but it's not that important to my overall purpose here. That said, if anyone has the definitive story on the TR designation in terms of what it originally meant and or what the name morphed into over the years, uh, I'm interested in uh, hearing it, so please uh, let me know. What I do want to point out is certain inconsistencies in the way the names of early TRs were presented as a prologue to my discussion of GT6. So I'll use the TR3 as an example here. As far as I can tell from a quick review of collections of period advertisements and other documents, the TR2 and the early TR3s at least were often presented with periods after the T and after the R which to me would lend credence to the possibility that these are initials for two different words. Later, the periods dropped out in UK publications in particular, and we began to see a preference in American marketing for using a hyphen between the TR and the numeral. Overall, then, we have essentially three major variations on the TR3 name as shown on the screen. These variations carried forward over the years through the TR4 and into the later cars, and the main pattern is that the periods seem to be dropped 
and the UK market was generally inclined to go with TR number all run together and the American market with TR hyphen number. I have some examples from ads here to uh, back up uh, what I've just discussed about the TR3. So here's a 1958 ad in a UK publication for the TR3. And you can see we have T period, R period three. This is a later ad in a collection of advertisements that appeared in the UK publication in 1973. And you can see at this point, TR3, the name is all of the characters run together, TR3. This is a 1959 ad for the American market. It features TR-3, and this is a 1960 ad for the American market, which also, again, TR-3 seems to be the American preference that developed. Since I briefly mused on the meaning of the TR designation, I do want to note that one American publication did seem to take the TR designation to mean triumph, at least in its headlines. Road Test Magazine, which ran in the United States from 1965 to 1981, claiming to be accurate, unbiased, and thorough, and at least originally eschewing advertising dollars, used TR Spitfire and TR GT6 in its headlines for reviews of the Spitfire Mark III and the GT6 Plus. However, out of all the articles that I've seen in my Brooklyn's portfolios and elsewhere, I think this is the only publication in which I've seen TR used in this way. But let's get to our focus on the GT6. And let me open by saying that what I'm offering here is not comprehensive. I obviously haven't combed through every book in detail looking for every little variation on the GT6 name. Uh, that'd be enormously time consuming and I don't necessarily have access to every resource out there. Uh, this is just a series of observations in terms of what I've seen in factory items and documents the last several years. Um, it obviously doesn't uh, capture everything. So on the GT6 Mark I vehicle badges, of course, uh, we got the GT over the 6, uh, which isn't that helpful for our purposes, but there you can see an image uh, of that badge. Um, it is uh, on the roof line uh, beneath the uh, tailgate. While inconsistency is evident early in both factory materials and automotive journalism, the early owner's handbook features GT6 all run together, and that seems to have been the most common presentation as seen in this ad and this one. But we do eventually get the preference for the use of a hyphen in U.S. marketing. Uh, here's a U.S. ad from 1968, and you can see it has GT-6. And I'll note here that Mike Cook seems to have consistently used a hyphen in the GT-6 name in his books, and he's probably the most authoritative source for the American uh, market. Uh, that seems to have been uh, his choice. I don't know how much editorial uh, input or, or interference with his publisher may have been involved in, in those choices, but um, it seems that uh, he preferred the hyphen. The earliest factory parts catalogs through 1970 presented GT6 with periods, including on the cover and spine at least, a period after the six. So we get G period, T period, six period. Inside the catalog, we generally get G period, T period, six. The factory workshop manual went with GT6 all run together, as may be seen on the cover here. And this brings us to the relatively wide array of variations on factory items with the arrival of the GT6 Mark II slash GT6 Plus that was produced from late 1968 through 1970. I'm going to especially focus on the Plus since I'm an American market guy, uh, but I do want to acknowledge some things about the Mark II badging. So let's start with the vehicle badges for the GT6 Plus, which are inconsistent on the car itself. Uh, and you can see that in your images here. The bonnet badge features odd spacing with a good gap between the GT and the 6. 
and then a space between the six and the plus that seems larger than that between the G and the T. Meanwhile, the rear badge clearly has GT6 plus all run together with the characters all evenly spaced. The rational explanation for the odd spacing on the bonnet badge is that the exact same size and shape badge was used for the GT6 Mark II for the home market and GT6 Plus just didn't neatly fit in the same space requiring creative spacing in presenting GT6 Plus. On the 1969 owner's handbook, uh, which covered uh, all markets, it covered uh, both the Mark II and the Plus, we get GT6 all run together on a shape meant to vaguely represent that of the bonnet badge. Then for the 1970 GT6 Plus, we get a more faithful representation of the bonnet badge for that car that features the odd spacing. By the way, I'm still not sure what happened in the home market or other markets that use GT6 Mark II for the 1970 owner's handbook. Um, I've not seen in any of my searches an orange 1970 owner's handbook that has GT6 Mark II on the cover. So I'm, I'm very much interested in getting some more information on uh, that particular issue. The augmented factory parts catalog uh, used uh, G period, T period, six plus as shown here. The augmented factory workshop manual typically wrote out plus instead of using the symbol, as you can see here and here. The 1969 U.S. sales brochure introduces a hyphen in GT6 Plus. Obviously, you can see there on your screen, GT hyphen 6 Plus. Between late 1967 and through 1969 in promotional materials, the McWilliams-led uh, Triumph uh, American marketing team used a blacklight theme. This was apparently um, the brainchild of Jimmy McWilliams. Uh, what you see on your screen here is an original promotional license plate sticker uh, for the 1969 model year that was distributed to dealers and it actually shows GT6 Plus all run together without the hyphen. The 1969 US ad campaign is really illustrative of the careless presentation of the GT6 name. On this full page GT6 Plus ad, the name is actually presented inconsistently on the ad. And the text of the ad, as circled in yellow here, is GT6 Plus, everything um, not all run together, but with the space between the T and the 6. But at the bottom of the page, circled in red, GT6 Plus is presented all run together with no spaces between the characters. Here's a half page ad from the same ad campaign, which seems to show the characters run together, although the spacing is not as clear as in other ads. And then in this multi-car ad from that same ad campaign, GT6 Plus is clearly presented with a space between the GT and the 6 Plus. Here's a close up so you can see that very clearly. Meanwhile, for reference over in the UK, we got the GT6 uh, MK2 on the 1969 uh, sales brochure. When the 1970 uh, model year rolled around, uh, the US operation was more consistently using the hyphen in the name. Here's the cover for the 1970 US sales brochure. And here's a rather famous 1970 print ad. And here's a close up of the bottom of that ad. Here's another 1970 ad that uses the hyphen, again, GT hyphen six plus. And now for an oddity, I've started collecting service training notes, booklets issued by the British Leyland Sales and Service Training Center. These are books that went with training film strips, uh, if you're old enough to remember those. And here's a book on emissions equipment that was published in November 1969 and covers models from 1968 
through 1970. Note that this book features G period, T period 6, uh, so the sort of normal presentation with periods for the 1968 uh, through 69 section of the book. But when this section's coverage of the GT6 begins, we actually get GT period 6. It's the only time I've seen this iteration on the name, and it's probably just a bit of sloppiness, uh, just a, a typo. Uh, but I thought it was worth uh, noting. Uh, weirdly, in the latter portion of the book, since the book does use the periods early on, but the second half of the book, we just get GT6 plus all run together without any periods. And just for the fun of it, I'll throw in the image of the GT6 plus from that uh, section of these uh, training notes. Very recently, uh, just in the nick of time uh, for this video, um, I received these service training notes covering Triumph engines. This booklet was printed in February of 1970, and by and large, it just refers to engines, and it refers to them by number of cylinders and capacity and that sort of thing. But I did want to note that inside of this booklet, um, we have GT6 presented just kind of all run together. And interestingly, this book it, booklet does not acknowledge um, the um, emissions controlled uh, engines um, when it comes to the engine prefixes. So here's a list, again, not necessarily a comprehensive list of all the various iterations of the GT6 names that I've found in official Triumph publications during that 1969 1970 window and you can see on the top there are a variety of representations of the name that feature periods in various ways uh, then there are those that do not feature periods uh, there are those with spaces uh, there are those with hyphens there are those with the plus symbol there are those with plus written out so just a variety of different ways in which GT6 was presented during this period. And last, I want to touch uh, briefly on the GT6 uh, Mark III. Uh, so here's one of the badges uh, from the car itself. And you can see this badge features an Arabic numeral, but on the owner's handbook, uh, we actually get uh, a Roman numeral. Uh, I do think that the Arabic numeral was used most frequently uh, overall. Um, here's a late sales brochure that has the uh, Arabic numeral and I, I believe the uh, factory parts catalog covering the Mark III's were the same in terms of uh, having an Arabic numeral on them. But regardless, uh, even though we don't have the same kind of uh, complexity as in the Mark II slash plus situation, Triumph still was inconsistent with how it visually represented um, the model name uh, through the Mark III. And that's the uh, end of our journey. As I announced at the outset, uh, no great payoff with this video, uh, no profound solution to a great mystery or anything like that. Just a journey through the maddeningly inconsistent ways in which Triumph represented GT6 and the various marks of that model uh, over the course of the production run. Certainly, Triumph violated every contemporary standard of marketing and branding that I'm aware of. And I am curious as to whether or not Triumph ever issued a style guide throughout the organization about this, or if it was just a matter of these being details that they didn't have time to fuss with compared with, for example, uh, responding to different safety legislation in different markets and things like that. Um, I'd like to know more, uh, but I'm sort of at the limits of uh, my knowledge uh, right now. I find this interesting that Triumph 
presented GT6 and the different mark names uh, so inconsistently, uh, you may not. Uh, and in fact, if you found this uh, extremely boring, actually, if you found this extremely boring, you're probably not still watching. So what I'm about to say is going to be lost on you. Um, but I do have some very different uh, material in the works, including I have a couple of uh, product reviews that I'm starting to work on. One of them is a review of a handmade by Heary Dash. Um, I just recently had Peter Heary uh, build a dash for my GT6, uh, trying to get as close to original as possible. So I'll share that story and that journey and, and talk about the finished product some. And summer is near, and I'm going to be doing a lot of uh, body work on my GT6, hopefully. And I'm going to share some of that including actually offering some videos uh, of my GT6 as opposed to uh, running through stills uh, as I did in my um, earlier uh, shaky uh, progress report on my work on the GT6. So uh, all of that is uh, coming up and uh, hopefully there'll be uh, something in there that uh, will be of interest. In the meantime, uh, thanks for watching.